The flight of a microwave-powered helicopter was demonstrated at a national press conference held at the Spencer Laboratory of the Raytheon Company in October 1964. In this demonstration, ordinary electrical power was converted into microwave power that was formed into a narrow beam aimed at the helicopter and converted back into DC power to be used in an electric motor to drive the helicopter rotor. The historic first flight of a microwave-powered helicopter was made inside the Spencer Laboratory in June of 1964. For the first time, a heavier-than-air vehicle was sustained by power derived solely from a microwave beam. In these first tests, the vertical distance of the flights was limited by mechanical constraints to a few inches. The microwave beam was formed in a horizontal plane and then deflected into a vertical direction underneath the helicopter by a metal sheet positioned at a 45-degree angle. To gain more experience, the helicopter was moved to an outside test range that would allow the helicopter to climb to an altitude of 60 feet. The inventor of the concept, William C. Brown from the Raytheon Company, describes the helicopter vehicle. The dominant feature of the helicopter is its rectenna that is fabricated from over 4,000 point contact diodes. In this scene, the flight of the helicopter is viewed from above as it is guided and held over the beam by three vertical tether wires. Attending the press conference was Percy L. Spencer, inventor of the microwave oven and many other microwave devices. This is another view of the helicopter. Later, this same helicopter was flown for a continuous period of 10 hours. We now turn our attention to the beam riding helicopter that will eliminate the need for any tethers with the help of the technology shown above. The beam riding helicopter was first tested with an arrangement that allowed the helicopter to move freely in six degrees of freedom, roll, pitch, yaw, and forward, lateral, and vertical translation. The microwave beam provides precision references for five of the six degrees of freedom. The outrigger horns sense the amplitude of the beam for lateral and forward positioning, while other sets of waveguides sense the phase front and polarization of the beam for roll, pitch, and yaw references. For free flight evaluation, the helicopter was placed on a microwave transparent landing pad seven feet above the special transmitting antenna that produced a smoothly shaped Gaussian beam. As power is applied to the rotor, the helicopter takes off from the landing pad and is held steady above the pad by the control system that senses any attitude or position errors which are then used to apply uh, corrective guidance. In this scene, the helicopter is viewed from below as a transmitting antenna would see it. The autopilot is a small red box on the front of the helicopter. It weighs one pound. The entire helicopter weighs about 12 pounds. In concluding this section of the film, the support of the Air Force for both the microwave-powered helicopter and the microwave beam riding helicopter is acknowledged. In 1969, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center became interested in the ability to transfer power from one space vehicle to another and initiated a new program that was to greatly refine rectenna technology. The improved rectenna in this 1970 laboratory demonstration is a dipole phased array. A closer inspection reveals that each dipole is terminated in a full wave bridge rectifier arrangement made from Schottky barrier diodes. This NASA sponsored activity at Raytheon culminated in a certified test to accurately measure the DC to DC efficiency of the system. Participating in this test were Raytheon's program manager, Owen Maynard, two quality assurance representatives from JPL, JPL program manager, Richard Dickinson, and the technical director, William Brown of Raytheon. These certified measurements made it possible to determine an overall DC to DC efficiency of 54% for a complete microwave power transmission system with a probable error of less than 1% for the measurement. The system is broken down to show the contributing efficiencies of the essential elements of the system. The scene will now shift to the construction of the individual rectenna elements that will become a part of a microwave power transmission demonstration on the Mojave Desert. There, the distance of power transmission will be one mile, more than 100 times greater than that in the laboratory. The power transmitted will be over 30 kilowatts, or nearly 100 times greater than that in the laboratory. The rectenna elements were thoroughly inspected and then carefully inserted into four by four foot modules. 17 of these modules were constructed and sent to the Venus site of the Goldstone Deep Space Tracking Facility operated by JPL or NASA. These modules were given severe environmental checks to assure their reliability in a severe outdoor environment. 
Here is a view of the transmission range at the Venus site at Goldstone in 1975. The 400 kilowatt transmitting antenna is in the foreground and the rectenna is located on a steep hill one mile from the transmitter. The rectenna is mounted on the range tower normally used to calibrate the transmitting antenna. As we zoom into the rectenna with the aid of a cherry picker, we get a good close-up look at the arrangement of the panels and then at the rows of rectenna elements themselves. Downhill and in front of the array is a bank of lights with the same geometric pattern as the rectenna. The bank of lights will absorb about one half of the 30 kilowatts of the DC power output from the rectenna. The balance is absorbed in resistive loads. Each set of two lights depends upon its respective panel in the rectenna to supply it with electrical power. As we take another close-up look at the rectenna, attention is called to the gain horn at the lower right-hand corner of the array that is used to quantitatively monitor the incident microwave power. The frequency of that microwave power is 2.38 gigahertz, or in wavelength, about 12 centimeters. It is of interest that the rectenna tower had a direct lightning strike in 1980, but that the rectenna remained operational even though 60-cycle transformers were burned out at the base of the tower. This is a close-up view of the 85-foot diameter antenna that will be used to scan the rectenna both horizontally and vertically. And this is a view from the controller's window with the transmitting antenna in the foreground and the rectenna in the background. The director, Richard Dickinson, is calling for the microwave beam to be turned on and to move the antenna in a horizontal direction. In this scene, the transmitting antenna is moving slowly from right to left. The bank of lights responds and remains brilliantly lit as the beam stops, directly pointed at the rectenna. With a slower horizontal sweep, the lights brighten and dim selectively as the sharp beam moves slowly across the rectenna. Back in the control room, the power output from each rectenna panel is shown on a bar graph. The transmitting antenna will now scan the beam in a vertical direction, and we will see the lights respond to this motion. One of the important facts established by these tests was an overall collection and rectification efficiency of the rectenna of 82%. This was in addition to the important demonstration that a very significant amount of power, 30 kilowatts, could be sent over a significant distance of one mile by means of a microwave power transmission system. This demonstration at Goldstone, together with the demonstration of an overall system efficiency of 54% in the laboratory, established free space microwave power transmission as a valid technology for such applications as a solar power satellite and microwave-powered high-altitude platforms in the Earth's atmosphere for communication and surveillance functions. <laughs>